If you have a Bible, uh, open up to Acts chapter 2. And I'm actually going to start reading in Matthew 3. You're like, those don't go together. But I'm going to start in Matthew 3, but open to Acts 2, because we're going to be in the book of Acts for the majority of tonight, really in Acts chapter 2 for a lot of tonight as well. And so if you want to open there, we'll get started. And I'm just going to jump right into Scripture tonight and uh, kind of get us set up for what we're going to be reading, uh, or what we're reading and what we're going to be talking about this evening. And so I'm ready to preach. Are you guys ready to receive? Okay. Let's have some fun tonight. Um, I've got some more props. We're going to do some crazy things up here, so we're going to have a good time. Matthew chapter 3, a little bit of context real quick. This is um, really in Jesus' like 30th year of life. He's about 30 years old, and a lot of people don't realize that Jesus didn't start ministry until he was 30. He had this little three-year stint, and he accomplished all the stuff that we read about in that short amount of time. And some of you are like, all I've done is change my major five times in three years. But Jesus changed the whole world in three years. And um, right before he begins his ministry, there's a guy named John the Baptist who was a, a prophet. Um, they, Jesus and John actually met when their moms were pregnant, like in the womb. It was kind of a, it's a really awesome story in the book of Luke. And so, um, but John the Baptist here is speaking right before Jesus begins his ministry, and he says this, I baptize you with, I almost fell, that was weird, I, almost bap- I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one, he's talking about Jesus, who is more powerful than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Everybody say fire. Fire. Let's try that again. Say fire. Fire. All right, I like that. So the Holy Spirit and fire. Keep that in mind for a moment. Then Acts chapter 2, where we're going to spend the majority of tonight, says this. Um, Actually, context again. This is now three years later, after Jesus' ministry. Jesus has died. He is resurrected. He has now, 40 days later, ascended into heaven And now about 10 days after that, the disciples and apostles are in this upper room, and they're waiting for this thing that Jesus said he was going to send. He was going to send this this spirit. He was always talking about it. And now they're just waiting. They don't really know what they're waiting for, how long they're going to be waiting. And here's what happens after Jesus ascends into heaven. It says this, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a noise came from heaven, and it sounded like a strong wind blowing. This noise filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they saw something that looked like flames of fire. Once again, everybody say fire. Fire. Flames of fire, and the flames were separated and stood over each person there, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I find this interesting, and these aren't the only two occurrences of this in the New Testament or in Scripture, but what I'm seeing here is this kind of, this thing that goes together. I'm seeing the Holy Spirit and fire. And I'm seeing fire and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and fire, fire and the Holy Spirit. And I'll make sense of all this in just a few moments. And tonight, if you're taking notes, I want to um, preach to you a message that I've entitled simply, Set Yourself on Fire. And not literally, okay? Like, metaphorically, spiritually speaking, set yourself on fire. Some of you, that it, like, excites you. You're like, childhood dream. Let's do it. Okay, let's go ahead and pray together before we dive into the rest of this. God, we love you. Lord, I just pray tonight that we would gain a greater understanding of who your Holy Spirit is. If if any of us have ever been turned away from this, or maybe we don't know much about it, God, I just pray that you would accurately articulate your word through my mouth tonight. Lord, speak to our hearts, open our hearts, open our minds like you've never opened them before so that we can receive what you want, God, which is ultimately the power of your spirit so we can walk out this life that you have set for us. God, we love you, and we just pray that you do what you want to do in this place tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said together. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in a series called Arrows, and uh, some of you have been here all three weeks of this series. We're going to finish it, wrap it up tonight. And uh, my brother, Dustin, who's one of the pastors here, um, he actually started Wake like over 12 years ago now. But he brought the word last week, and we got to watch on live stream. I heard from a lot of you guys that he did a phenomenal job. And uh, he's, I think he's watching on live stream, or sometimes he sneaks in the back. He's a little creepy like that. But um, hey, I don't know if he's here or not, but can we give it up for Pastor Dustin? Just thank him for that word. If you missed it, get online, get on Vimeo um, and watch that. I promise you, he was talking about the pool, and it's just, I mean, it was cool. You got to definitely check that out. And then week one, though, a couple weeks ago, um, I kicked off the series, and I was talking about this concept, this idea, and this image that has stuck with me for the last couple of months, and it's just something I can't get out of my head. And I was listening to a sermon, and the pastor was talking about this idea of arrows in the hands of God. And he was saying that we as believers, that we should view ourselves, we should view our lives like an, like an arrow, if you will. I've got an arrow right here. We should view our lives like an arrow, 
And he said, really, it's not an arrow that we want to hold on to. This is an arrow that we want to place into the hands of God. Because how many of you guys know this, this arrow, now that we've talked about it a couple of weeks, represents you. This represents your life. Not just a piece of your life, not just part of it, but the entirety of your life. And so basically what we're saying is we want to put our life into the hands of our great God. How many of you guys know that your life in God's hands is in better hands than if it's in your hands? You know that, right? And so that requires a lot of trust because God is like, if you go along this metaphor with me, God is like this cosmic archer ready to shoot you, ready to send you wherever he wants to send you. And that can be kind of a terrifying thought. Like, God, I want to decide where I go. Like, I want to know where I'm headed. And God's like, that's not how this works. I need you to give me your life. I need you to trust me enough to know that I wrote the plan for your life and you ought to let me send you where I need to send you. Let me send you where I want to send you. And it takes so much faith and trust in God to get to that point. But guess what? We can trust God. How many of you guys know that? We can trust the hands of God. His hands are good. His hands are trustworthy. He's got the best plan for you and for your life. But tonight, what I want to do, uh, having a little fun with this in a moment, but I want to continue this illustration. I want to continue this idea a little bit further. And I want to talk specifically tonight and I promise you this will make sense with arrows in just a moment, but I want to talk specifically tonight about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you, the second I say that, you're like, I don't even know what that means. Like, I have no context, no frame of reference for that. Others of you, like, it kind of terrifies you a little bit. You're like, I've heard people talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were crazy. Like, they had that crazy look in their eye. You ever met a crazy Christian before? Like, let me see your hand if you've met a crazy Christian. Let me see it. If you're not raising your hand, it's you. Okay, so... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, I've never met one. That's why your eye's twitching. Okay, so, but there's some crazy Christians out there, and I, I just want to start right off the bat by saying the Holy Spirit is not weird. It's not normal, right, because nothing supernatural is normal, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird. I've been in church my whole life. I've met a lot of weird people. People are weird. You meet weird people at school. You meet them, you work with a lot of weird people. People are what make these things uh, weird. It's what makes it yeah, kind of cringeworthy for us. So I just wanted to give hopefully some clarity tonight. So I want to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and like we just read, I think this image is going to help us tonight. Um, being filled with the Holy Spirit, according to what we just read, is kind of like a fire being lit inside of us. It says the, the baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. When they're in the upper room, this mighty rushing wind comes in, and all of a sudden they're seeing these tongues, these flames of fire that are resting on every one of these apostles, and they, in that moment, are empowered. As they are filled, as the fire is present, they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and I got to be honest with you guys. I kind of love, I've been excited to do this for a while, let me be honest. I kind of love that the Holy Spirit is symbolized by fire. That's nice. Oh, my God. There's a lot of fire flu on that. I kind of like that the Holy Spirit is symbolized by fire because I think this gives us a pretty incredible picture of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and through us. Now, stay with me for a moment because fire, how many of you guys know fire represents power, and it has for thousands of years. One of the, the nature of fire is that fire spreads, and, you know, like you, when, when fire begins to spread, I mean, it takes so much work to put that thing out. By nature, it wants to spread. It wants to move. Fire brings light. For thousands of years, this was the only form of light people had in the darkness. And, and the last thing is that fire brings passion, right? Like fire symbolizes passion. When, when, and you know this because when there's that old couple and uh, they still got passion, you're like, man, they still got that fire. Like it's awkward, but they still got that fire. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put this out before like, I set the church on fire because that's not really my plan. Uh, for tonight, but anyway, just wanted to show you guys a picture tonight, because, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that, I just did so much to make that happen, um, <laughs> I love when I get a putter for nothing, okay, but I really do appreciate it, now here's the deal, the reason I show you that tonight is, I love this image so much more, when I'm not just simply handing God the, the arrow, when I'm not just simply handing God my life, but I'm handing God an arrow that has been lit on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that, here's the deal, I don't know where my arrow is going to land, but what I can know is what my arrow is going to do when it does land. That when it does show up, wherever it's going, that I'm coming with the power of the Holy Spirit wherever I go. I want to be marked 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. When God sends me and I land where he sent me, I want to be marked by power. I want to be somebody that everywhere I go, I spread like fire. I spread the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ. I spread the love of God every single place that I go. Do you know as a Christian, it's not just like a suggestion, but it is literally your duty everywhere you go to be like Christ and to spread his love. Everywhere you go. And I think we should check ourselves for a moment and be like, am I spreading love at work? Am I spreading love at school, in my home? Am I, am I spreading like fire? If when we're lit by the Holy Spirit, man, I, that fire brings light. So that every place that we travel, we are bringing the light of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ. And fire brings passion. I think Christians should be the most passionate people on the planet. I'm going to say that one more time. I think Christians should be the most passionate people on the planet. We should be marked by a, a passion. There should be something different about us. That we're not just simply excited about life and we don't just get passionate and excited when life is good. But we understand that because we're alive and because we're breathing, God has a purpose for us. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I walk out the call of God on my life so that people can know the hope of Jesus Christ. Christians should be passionate people. And so I want to ask you real quick, have you set yourself on fire? Would you look at somebody next to you real quick and say, just say, are you on fire? Just ask them real fast. Now look at somebody else real quick and just say like, say, I want to be on fire. I want to be on fire. It's kind of a weird thing to say, right? And so I want to ask you that question. Are you, have you set yourself on fire? Are you marked by those things? As a believer, do you feel like you're walking in this life with, with passion? Do you feel like you're operating with power? Are you spreading the light of Christ? Are you spreading the gospel and the truth of Christ everywhere you go? And if you can't say yes to those, if you'd say, I'm kind of living a passionless life, I don't really have, I don't feel like I have much that I'm living for, I don't know exactly what my purpose even is, then, then I may argue tonight that maybe you've had a moment in an experience with, with Jesus but maybe you haven't had that complete filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. So I'm telling you, you can't be a Christian with no passion when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. When you have the, the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit, you live with passion. You know, Jesus, he hyped up the Holy Spirit a lot. He was like a Holy Spirit hype man while he was here on earth. Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, you see that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. There's this epic moment in his baptism where the entire Trinity is present and the, the heavens open up and the, the Holy Spirit's descending and Jesus is there and God is speaking, the Father. And so he's filled with the Spirit. He's empowered. And then all throughout his ministry, when he's hanging out with the disciples, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's like, guys, this, this pretty amazing person called the Holy Spirit, they're coming. And he's talking about it in John chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 1. He just keeps repeating over and over that this Holy Spirit is coming. He was hyping it up like crazy. He's like, guys, you're going to do even greater things than I do because of the Holy Spirit. Like he would do this epic miracle. They were like, oh my gosh. They're like falling on their knees, worshiping him. He's like, you're going to do greater things than this? And they're like, I don't, how? That doesn't make any sense. And he said, I'm sending someone better. And then Jesus even had the audacity to say that it is to your advantage that I leave. And I feel like when he said that, he said that to a bunch of blank faces. They like, I don't think they bought that for a second. They're like, no, Jesus, like, just stay here. You know what I mean? If you're a disciple, like, wouldn't you want Jesus just to stay? Like, just hang out, bro. Like, we'll just, we'll die old together. It'll be magical, you know? They wanted Jesus to stay. And he's like, guys, it is to your advantage that I leave. And if I'm in the disciples' shoes, I'm like, I'm not buying this. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, right, Jesus. You know, like, Jesus, I've seen you walk on water. Is the next guy going to be able to walk on water? Like, I've seen you heal people, Jesus. I've seen you heal the blind. I've seen you heal blind people, deaf people, mute people, and dead people, Jesus. Is the next guy going to be able to do that? And I'll be like, oh, you know, Jesus, remember that one time we were at that, that wedding reception and, like, the greatest tragedy of all time happened and we ran out of wine? Like, the disciples were young adults. This was their greatest struggle, okay? So <laughs> they run out of wine, and guess who they call on? Jesus. He shows up, he grabs the water, he turns that H2O into Merlot right there. First miracle he's ever done. And they're like, is the next guy going to do that, Jesus? Like, I don't buy this, you know? I'm telling you, if I'm one of the disciples, I'm like, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you hype up this Holy Spirit, but I'm not sure that I buy it. Like, I'm not sure that anything could be better than you walking here with us 
side by side, but Jesus just kept on. He kept hyping the Holy Spirit. He's like, guys, this is going to blow your minds what begins to take place when I leave and this Holy Spirit comes. Now, have any of you guys ever had somebody hype something up to you and it just like did not meet expectations at all? Has that ever happened to you? How many of you have done that to people before? You've hyped something up. It breaks my heart. I hype up honey butter chicken biscuits all the time. And one person came back to me, they're like, it wasn't that good. I was like, just ripped my heart out. Like, it's literally the worst thing you could say to me. But one time, this is about seven years ago, I want to tell this long story short. About seven years ago, I invited everyone to come to this movie, and I was, I was hyped about this movie. Because a couple years before that, when I was at college, I'm going to admit something to you I don't want to admit, but when I was in college, we were pretty limited on our television stations in our dorm room. We had like USA and Nicktoons. <laughs> and so I ended up watching four full seasons of this show called Avatar, The Last Airbender. Is there anybody else in here? Raise your hand if you know. Okay. Everyone in here just took a big sigh of relief. They're like, I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm not the only grown-up that watches cartoons. So college, I watched this cartoon show, and it's like, it's actually really good. If you get time, check it out. And so I, I love it, and I find out that the movie's coming out. They're calling it The Last Airbender. It's Avatar, but it's not the blue people. It's completely different. They're calling this The Last Airbender. And I'm like, guys, this is going to be the greatest movie to ever hit theaters, ever. Like, I'm not even kidding you. Like, Gone with the Wind, nothing. The other Avatar, pff, nothing, you know. And so I'm telling them, like, we got to go. I end up getting about 30 people to go to a midnight premiere of The Last Airbender. We have two rows taken up. It's the 3D showing. Everybody's ticket costs at least $57. And we're sitting in there. And I'm still hyping it up. Like, we, we went to this midnight premiere, and I'm like, we got to get there early. We're the only ones in the theater. I should have known. So we're sitting there, and I'm still hyping this up. I'm, like, showing people, like, cartoon episodes. I'm like, this is Aang, and, like, you know, all these different people. And I'm, like, leaning down the row, like, this just, your mind's going to be blown, you know? And all of a sudden, the movie starts, and I'm like, something's wrong. Like, from the moment this thing starts. I got to be real, guys. <laughs> you know, this is literally... The worst movie I have ever seen. Not even kidding. Like, not top five, not top three. I put, I put The Last Airbender, number one. The worst movie I've ever seen. And halfway through this movie, like, great friends of mine, people I love that love me, they're standing up, and they're just going, and they're just walking out of the theater. They're like, I'm going to go to bed. It's two in the morning. This is stupid. Why are we here? I have other friends throwing popcorn at me. People are texting me, like, you owe us $30. Like, I want my money back. And I just, like, I was sitting there, and I'm sitting next to Delaney. I'm dating her at the time, and I apologize. I'm like, I am so sorry. And she's like, I'm fine. You bought my ticket. So uh, <laughs> she's just chilling. She's, like, not bothering me. She's just on her phone, like, checking Instagram. And... A terrible moment. Some of you guys, you really want a girlfriend. I'm like, your wallet can't handle a girlfriend right now. It's expensive. Like, just take a moment, count your blessings, count your additional dollars. Just know that this is all in God's timing. But anyway... I'm mortified, and I'm apologizing to everybody. Like, I still have people that give me a hard time about this to this day because I hype this thing up so much. They're expecting the greatest thing ever, and it is literally the worst thing ever. Now, here's the deal. Um, Jesus is hyping this Holy Spirit so much, like more than anything's ever been hyped up. And I just got to tell you that what happened with the disciples was the complete opposite of what happened with us at that movie. Because what Jesus said, and as he explained it, I think the disciples, if they were here today to tell us, they would say, as much as Jesus hyped up this Holy Spirit, it didn't even come close to what we really experienced. Like, it was far greater. It was far better. That power that he kept talking about, that power was more intense than he ever could have even expressed or explained. What happened in Acts chapter 2 didn't just meet expectations, it exceeded every expectation. He hyped it up, and the Holy Spirit showed up. He didn't disappoint, and it was in that moment that the disciples were empowered to do everything that they're about to do over the next 30 or 40 years. And if you've read the book of Acts, have you seen what the disciples did? Have you seen what these apostles, what they were able to do and accomplish through this power of the Holy Spirit in just about a mere 30 years or so? There, there's a quote in the Bible from a, a Roman that says that these, these disciples, these apostles, have turned the world upside down. In that short amount of time, they're like, they have turned this known world completely on its head. They were that effective. And I'm here to tell you tonight that the reason they were effective is because of what happened in that room that night. 
The reason they were effective is not just because they believed in God, not just because they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but because they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they operated through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think some of you might be walking through this, this Christian walk and you're like, why do I not feel effective? Why am I still so timid? Why do I just keep falling back into the same old stuff over and over again? Why is this not what I thought it was going to be? And maybe it's because, yeah, you believe in God, you've accepted Christ, but you have, you're not walking with that filling and that power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that can change tonight. And we have access to that same power. I think Wake can be known for the group that just in a short amount of time, people are saying, Wake, that's that group that turned Albuquerque upside down. That's that group that turned you and him completely upside down. And I think that's what we can be known for. That's what I pray that we become known for. But we need the power. Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and you might be thinking, okay, power, that sounds great. But empowered, like for what? Just to have power? Empowered to do what? And I want to just go with you through a few things real fast tonight. I want to show you as we gain the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit, the things that we are, we become empowered to do. So if you're taking notes down, you can write that down. Empowered to do what? Through the Holy Spirit. We are empowered to. And the first thing is this. Number one, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. The Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. I know that sounds like a big church word. And you're like, okay, that's like not that cool. But let me show you what this looks like. Romans 8 verse 9 says this. Paul's writing to the church in Rome. And he says, but you are not controlled. Look at this. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Now, can I work backward through this passage real quick? He says, if you have the Spirit of God living in you, then you will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You will be guided and led by the Holy Spirit, and you are no longer controlled by your sinful nature. Now, as we read that, for some of you, that's encouraging, and you're like, I know what that feels like. I used to have the sinful nature, and now I feel that I'm, I'm being led by the Spirit, not by my flesh. I think others of you, when you read that, you're like, maybe a little bit concerned. So like, I'm looking at my life, like, if I'm honest with myself tonight, I feel like I'm controlled by my sinful nature, because I keep ending up in places that I know I shouldn't be, and honestly, a big part of me doesn't want to be there, but I keep showing up there anyway. I keep doing things that I know that I shouldn't be doing, and things that a huge part of me doesn't want to do, but, but I keep doing them anyway. Some of you, are, you, you have an addiction right now. And it's controlling you, whatever that addiction might be. And so you read a verse like that, and you're like, okay, it's become pretty evident that I'm still being controlled, not by the Holy Spirit, but I'm being controlled by my sinful nature. Now, I want to be careful to let you know that just because you sin doesn't mean you're being controlled by your sinful nature. I'm talking more about this repeated over and over, like you've never left that behind. This addiction that has gripped you and has not let you go since the moment you accepted Christ. And so tonight, if we're honest with ourselves, we're saying, I'm still controlled by my flesh. And have any of you guys ex ever experienced this, this, this internal battle that's continually going on where so much of you wants to do right and so much of you still wants to do wrong? Have you ever experienced that before? Paul writes about that. Paul admits it. He's like, I do the things I don't want to do. And, I have, and he's just, he sounds like, like a crazy person in Romans chapter 7. And he's just trying to show us that I battle as well. We're going to always battle with our flesh. But there's a difference between the battle with the flesh and being controlled by your flesh. And as believers, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because I believe this, that without the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are destined to continue in our sin. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, addictions remain addictions. That thing that you're addicted to, you will remain addicted to, and you will continue in your sin. Um, the, the book of Proverbs makes this reference, and Peter actually quotes it a couple thousand years later. And it says this, it says that person that continues to, to, that sins, and then walks away, and then returns back to their sin, he gives us this picture, and he says, it's like a dog that returns to its vomit. You ever experienced that before? Where your dog's making that really weird coughing sound, and you look over, and it's like, oh my gosh, and you just like threw up everywhere? So you go to the kitchen to grab some paper towels, and you come back, and the, the throw up's gone, and he's just looking at you like, what? Like, you know <laughs> It looked good. Um, and then you, some of you still let your dog look you in the face. I'll never understand you. But check this out. Think about it. He says, the person that just, that sins, walks away and comes back and sins, and walks away and comes back and continues to do these things. He said, you're like a dog returning to vomit. 
And what's interesting is we probably don't want to come back to that vomit, but because we haven't let go and we haven't given up control from our flesh and gained the control of God through his Holy Spirit, we continue to go back time and time and time again. And it's a little quiet in here right now because I think I'm getting into some of your mail a little bit right now. And so that's this, this understanding that you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And you might be thinking, well, I don't understand this because, like, if I've accepted Christ as my Savior, like, how do I keep, like, I, I keep sinning? How is that possible? Because like, I'm saved, but I sin. Does that mean I'm not really saved? That's not what it means. Let me, let me give you a little bit of theology here, and this will come up on the screen to help you out. Just so you know this, accepting Christ forgives you of your sins. Receiving the Holy Spirit frees you from your sins. You want freedom? You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we are immediately forgiven when, it comes into, when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But how many of you know that doesn't mean your baggage just immediately left you? Just because you got saved doesn't mean that addiction immediately went away. And so we have to be freed from those things by the power of the Holy Spirit. The second thing is this tonight. That the Holy Spirit empowers me to choose correctly. Choose correctly. Or you can put choose wisely, whatever you like better. But the Holy Spirit allows me, empowers me to choose correctly. How many of you have ever just made a dumb choice at some point in your life, right? The Holy Spirit helps us make less of those. <laughs> so he helps you, he empowers you to choose correctly. Isaiah 30, and he's prophesying here about this coming Holy Spirit. He's speaking a thousand years before this, this Holy Spirit comes, but he says this, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. How incredible is that? When you come to these moments in life where there's maybe a couple of options of, of sin and that way out that the Bible promises you, it's the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, this is the way, walk in that way, not the other way. When you come to that crossroads where you don't know what to do next and you're, you're looking at maybe a couple of colleges, you're looking at what majors you want to select, it's the voice of the Holy Spirit that behind you is saying, this is the way, walk in it. I don't know about you, but I've had so many times in my life where I've needed guidance and I've needed direction in my life. I've needed that voice to allow me to avoid potential harm in my life. Our, um, our daughter, Finley, she just turned a year old, which does that blow anybody else's mind? Because it blows mine. Okay. So she just turned a year old, and I promise you, my daughter has a death wish. She does. Like, she loves danger. I turn my head from her for one second. I, like, look away to grab something. I turn around. She's, like, at the top of our stairs, like, about to dive off the staircase. And, um, you know, she watches us do stuff, so now she grabs, like, cords, and she's trying to plug them into the wall. She's like, I'm a grown woman. I can do this, you know? And cause she, It's just funny. I walked over the other day, and she's trying to plug my wife's, uh, like, curling iron into the wall, and I'm, like, freaking out. And so she, she keeps going back to these dangerous things, and, and I swear she saw this, like, on YouTube or something, but she's attempted the, the Tide Pod Challenge a couple of times. And so we haven't let it get into her mouth, but we're, like, we locked everything up. We're good now, okay? We're good parents. Don't report us. And... But I just feel like constantly, I'm following her around. She's crawling everywhere. She's about to start walking. So God, you know, help us. Pray for us, everybody. So she's about to start walking. And I'm following her everywhere. And just constantly, when she's about to do something that's going to hurt her, she has no idea. She's just curious. She's like, that looks nice. And I'm like, no, that's going to kill you, you know. And, and I'm there to just say, hey. And I, I make a sound. I'm there to grab her. I'm there to move her. I'm there to say something to get her attention and then put her attention onto something else, something better, something safer for her. And I feel like that's so often how the Holy Spirit operates in our life because we, we often, maybe things aren't inherently bad that we're trying to do, that we're about to attempt, but God, through his sovereignty and his foreknowledge, knows that that's a path that's not going to lead you where you want to go. That's a path that's going to cause more difficulty, difficulty and more harm so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, you need to be in tune to my voice because I'm going to tell you that this is the path, walk this way, not that way. And a lot of the time, it's not even that he's taking us from something that looks bad, it might look good, and so that's why we have to be in tune to the Holy Spirit. This happened to me, I was telling this to our, our high schoolers last night, but this happened to me, my junior year of college, um, I was working at a church in the North Dallas area, and I'm, I'm loving the church, I love uh, I love everything about it. And they, in April of that year, right before I was about to come home for the summer, they offered me a youth pastor position. And I was like, not expecting it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Like, I love this church. There's a great family that's, you know, a part of this church. Um, and then I was, I was like, I love Dallas. I love the Dallas Cowboys, even though they don't love winning. And I love, you know, all these, everything looked right. 
Like, have you ever had moments like that? Like, there was nothing wrong with it. I felt like I could have said yes, and it would have been, you know, a pretty good decision. And as they told me, like, everything in me was like, oh, I just want to say yes to this. And I was like, give me a few days. Let me talk to my parents. Let me, let me go pray about this a little bit. And so what was so weird is as good as everything felt about it, the moment that I began to pray, I began to realize immediately that God wanted me to go back to Albuquerque. And I had no idea why. And I was sitting there like, are you serious? Like, there's nothing for me in Albuquerque. And I don't mean that as a, as a rag on Albuquerque. I love this place. But coming back to our church, there was not an open, opening for a youth pastor position. My brother was the pastor of this ministry. Like, there was nothing in line for me. There was nothing open for me. And I was just thinking, God, why do you want me to go back to Albuquerque? That makes no sense. But I felt the Holy Spirit, that voice behind me saying, this is the way. Just walk in it. Trust me. And so what did I do? I had to call those people and I said, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know why, but I need to go home this summer. I'm, I, I got to, you know, say I, I'm not part of this. I can't take the job. And the craziest thing happened. The week that I come back to Albuquerque, the very week I show up, I walk into Wake. Wake used to be on Thursday nights. I walk into Wake on a Thursday night, the first week I'm back, and I'm just kind of one of the leaders. I'm not the pastor. I'm just like hanging out. And I'm out in the atrium, and this girl named Delaney McKee walks in the front doors of our church and it was that night that this girl that I barely knew from high school, we kind of started the conversation, and I was like, I was already, like, the heavens opened, and God told me, like, this is the one. You know, there's kind of that moment, but, but we began a conversation, and I kind, of, I kind of threw in there, like, hey, I'm preaching next week, come back. You know, and um, <laughs> preached the greatest sermon of my life. But that was the beginning of me dating who I would eventually marry. And now we've been married. We just celebrated on January 25th five years of marriage, which is just insane. <laughs> We have a one-year-old daughter, and I believe with all my heart that my wife, this wasn't just like, oh, like, this is who I'm going to marry. My, my marriage, I know this for a fact, my marriage is part of my future calling, because for what God wants us to do, and my wife, like, like she can preach, like, she's going to be a part of ministry with me my entire life. God needed me to go home so that I could have that encounter and that moment with Delaney so that we could end up where we are now. And I sometimes get sick to my stomach thinking about how close I was to staying in Dallas. And I don't think that I would be married her to, to her today. I wouldn't have my daughter. And so you have to be that in tune to the Holy Spirit. Number three is that the Holy Spirit empowers me to act supernaturally. There's a short one. To act supernaturally. Acts 2.43. So the deep sense of awe came over all of them. This is right after they were filled with the Spirit in the upper room. And the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. They perform many miracles, signs, and wonders. I don't know about you, but I do not want to live a natural life. I want to live a supernatural life. I don't want to get to the end of my life, and all I can see is everything that I did and everything that I accomplished and all the great things that I made happen. I want to see what God did and what God accomplished and all the great supernatural things that God made happen in my life. Am I the only one? I want to live a supernatural life. I want to see the miraculous take place. I want to be, understand that, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, I have the ability to lay hands on people to pray for the sick, and the Bible says that they can be healed. I want to see the supernatural take place. And I'll just be honest for a moment. I have prayed for people that have still passed away, but I've also prayed for people that have undoubtedly been healed by God in that moment. And so with that in mind, I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to believe that God wants to do the supernatural in my life and in your life and in this ministry. And I want, you to, I want you to begin to believe that God wants to do the supernatural in your life. God doesn't want you to live a normal, natural life. He wants you to see him working and moving every single day of your life. But you've got to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what allows you to act supernaturally. And the fourth thing, fourth and final thing is that the Holy Spirit enables me to speak boldly. Now, because we're talking about speaking, I'm going to have you guys say this with me. Everybody, boldly, say this. Say, speak boldly. Speak boldly. One more time. Say, speak boldly. speak boldly. The Holy Spirit enables me to speak boldly. And some of you right now, that, that's kind of maybe your struggle. Like, I, I'm not great with using my words. I'm not great with this idea of having a public faith where people know that I'm a Christian. I've got to tell people about my faith in Jesus Christ. This is my struggle. Can I show you something pretty incredible in Scripture real quick? Going back to Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit enables us to speak boldly. Acts chapter 2, it says this. 
Verse 14, then Peter stood up. So he was just filled with the Holy Spirit. He now in front of thousands of people, look at this. Then Peter stood up. He goes outside with the other 11 apostles. He spoke loudly so that all the people could hear. He said, my Jewish brothers and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me. And I will tell you something you need to know. Listen carefully. And if you've read this portion of Acts chapter 2, Peter launches into this pretty epic sermon. It's an incredibly convicting message. Like, he's just calling people out. It's that kind of sermon, like, if I preached it when you brought your friend, you'd be like, oh my gosh, like, this is just too much. You know, and, and Peter preaches this amazing message filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you get to the end of the sermon, check this out. In verse 41, this is incredible. It says, then those who accepted what Peter said were baptized, and on that day, 3,000 people were added to the group of believers. His first sermon ever, 3,000 people get saved. My first sermon ain't nobody gets saved, but 3,000 people were saved in that moment. Now keep that in mind. Would you guys agree that's pretty incredible? One message, 3,000 people. That's like our dream for Wake U as we continue to grow this thing, as we have to move this thing into the pit. We want there to be one moment, one night, where 3,000 people get saved. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. This is, an, this is an incredible moment. This is how the church starts in the book of Acts. Off to a good start. But what I find so fascinating is when you look at this in comparison to something that took place six weeks earlier. So you go back six weeks and that same guy, Peter, that stood up in front of thousands of people and preached that message, 3,000 are saved. Six weeks before that, do you remember where we find Peter? Jesus has been arrested. He's on trial and Peter's standing in the back of this courtyard, just trying not to be seen. He's, he's looking at Jesus from a distance. He's terrified of what's going on, what might happen to him. And Peter's in the background, and he's approached by three people. And these three people ask Peter if he knows Jesus. They're like, you kind of look like a guy that's, that's been around with him. You look like one of those Galileans that's been going around with Jesus. Do you know him? Three people ask Peter, and on three separate occasions... He denies that he even knows Jesus. One of the people he denies Jesus to is this young servant girl. Like that's how intimidated, that's how afraid, that's how, um, that this, is, this is the place. This is how broken Peter is in this moment. And I begin to look at this. What happened to where in one moment Peter is denying that he even knows Jesus in front of three people and just a mere six weeks later, he is declaring as loudly as he can. He is professing the name of Jesus to over 3,000 people. What happened? And I begin to look at Acts chapter 2, and I realize what happened is that Peter, in the scene in the trial, was not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. But Peter, in Acts chapter 2, right before he stands, when, once he stands up, Peter has been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. You want to know what took Peter from being afraid to having that kind of boldness, it was the Holy Spirit. Some of you tonight, as a believer, if you were honest, you'd say, I'm not walking in boldness. I'm actually walking around with the spirit of timidity. I don't even want people to know I'm a Christian. I'm not gonna tell people about my faith. I'm not gonna invite people to wake. I'm not gonna invite people to my church that I attend. I'm not gonna, to, I'm not gonna bring testimony to what God has done in my life and share my story because you're afraid. And I believe that if we are Christians that are operating out of fear, then we are Christians that are not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. The two don't go together. You got to understand that tonight. The two do not go together. And so if you're afraid of public faith and to speak about Jesus, then I believe you need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I begin to look at this, and in, in the last thing I want to bring to your attention is that Jesus was so concerned about them having all these things we just talked about, these four things, being guided by the Spirit, being empowered by the Spirit, being able to make the right choices, all of these various things, being able to speak boldly. He was so concerned with them being able to do all these things. Now, catch this. This is, this is important. We read Matthew 28, 19 all the time, therefore go and make disciples, and we act like that's the very last thing he said, but what we forget is that Jesus also followed that up by saying, now, before you go, I need you guys to wait in Jerusalem. I need you to go to that room, and I need you to wait. And this, is, this kind of blew my mind a little bit. That's, that reference is in Luke 24. He says, go to Jerusalem and wait, because I'm sending 
the helper. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And this, this kind of blew my mind a little bit because I'm like, Jesus, we don't have a lot of time. Like, wouldn't you tell these disciples, just go. Go start making disciples. Go start walking out your calling. Go start building the church and, and walking out this ministry. But he says, before you go, I need you to wait because I need you to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Catch that. That's vital. Before you go, I need you to be empowered. I need you to have the helper. So I think Jesus understood that once they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, what they would be able to do with the church is exponentially greater than what they could have ever done on their own. They needed the Holy Spirit in their life. And I think that some of you right now, you might be a little stalled out in life. You might feel like we talked about last week that you've been pulled back and like God's just waiting. God's just being way too patient with you. And, and for a lot of us, we're, we're waiting on God. We're like, God, what's your move? I'm ready, God, send me. And God's like, here's the deal. You're not waiting on me, I'm waiting on you. Because before I launch you into your calling, before you begin to step out in ministry, before you launch out into your future, I need you to have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I need you not to operate in fear and timidity. I need you not to be lost in this life, but I need you to have guidance and direction. So I need you to have the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, we need to set ourselves on fire. Tonight, we need to light ourselves on fire through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. Some of you tonight, I'm going to read off a few things, and I want you to identify with one of these or maybe several of these, because I think if you can identify with one of these, I think it's evidence that you need the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because some of you, you know you're calling, but you felt absolutely powerless to make it happen. But I believe tonight you can gain that power. Some of you, you feel stuck in sin. You have an addiction that's been around for far too long, and it just keeps wrapping you up. You're controlled by your sinful nature, but tonight you can be set free from that sin and that addiction. Some of you, you feel totally and completely lost, and you have for like maybe the majority of college or your young adult life. You feel lost, but I believe tonight you can receive guidance and direction by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you walked in here tonight and you're discouraged. You walked in with your head hanging down, but I believe tonight the Bible says that he is our helper and he is our encourager. I believe tonight the Holy Spirit can lift your head and restore the joy that you need in your life once again. Some of you, like I mentioned a moment ago, you're afraid of public faith. And can I just say, there's no way you're alone in that. I've faced that. I have moments still where I'm afraid at times. I have that fear at times. But some of you, you are, you're afraid of public faith. You do not want people to know where you go on Wednesday nights. You don't want people to know that you're a believer. If you're out in public talking to somebody about Jesus, you want them to talk real quiet so nobody can overhear the conversation. And I'm telling you, that is not a life marked by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not the life that God wanted us to live as followers of Christ. He wanted us to live with power. He wanted us to live with passion. He wanted what we are to spread everywhere we go. He wanted us to bring light into this dark world every day of our life. Now, here's what this looked like in the Bible. This might be confusing to some of you because you're like, if I've received Jesus, then don't I have the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, the Bible makes that clear. But there's something that's undeniable throughout the New Testament. On at least seven occasions, believers in the New Testament, they believed in Jesus, they had received Jesus as their Savior, and the apostles would still approach them and ask them, have you received the power of the Holy Spirit? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And if they said no, they would lay hands on them, and they would pray that they would receive the Holy Spirit, as simple as that. And in that moment, those people then began to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, tonight, I'm going to ask you guys to stand to your feet for a moment. Now, I'm going to start by saying, I'm not going to do anything weird tonight. Those of you who have like a little bit of a fear and a phobia of the Holy Spirit, and you've seen this thing abused all the time, I'm going to promise you right here in this moment that nothing weird is going to happen tonight at all. I just want to pray for you. So what I want to know right now, and I don't know if this is one person in here, I highly doubt it is. I think it's more like hundreds. If we got real and we were honest right now, but if you can relate to any of those things that I was just saying, that you're stuck in sin, you're not feeling bold, you're, you have all of these, these moments of timidity going on in your life, but you want the power of the Holy Spirit. You want to be bold about your faith. 
And tonight, with no, no heads bowed, I just want to know if this is you. I think it's the moment of boldness. It's our first step. But you would say, Brandon, I don't think I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't think I've been operating by the power of the Holy Spirit. As I take inventory of my life and what I'm doing, would you be brave enough and bold enough right now? And you can begin to pray, God, give me the boldness to do this. Would you just raise a hand and leave it up? That I need to be operating with the power of the Holy Spirit. Look around for a moment. I just want you to see how many people. And I begin to think about this. Keep it up just for a moment. And I just begin to think about this. What would happen in this ministry if every hand that was raised began to operate with that power? This becomes an unstoppable force in that moment. This is when that becomes that movement that turns this city upside down for the cause and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Because you saw that's, that's 150, a couple hundred people that just raised their hand. And again, I promise you, we're not gonna do anything weird. I wanna pray for you. And I'm gonna have people around you extend their hand towards you in a second. And we're just going to pray tonight and we're going to ask. You do not have to beg God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You just simply have to ask him. He says, ask in my name and it will be done for you. Ask in my name and it will be given to you. And I believe God is waiting and ready for us to say, God, will you please, will you give me the gift of your Holy Spirit? I need to operate in that power. And so tonight I just want to ask you to do this boldly tonight. And I want to pray for you up here at the front. If you raise a hand, would you walk out of your seat and would you meet me up at the front tonight? Just step out. Be the first one to step out tonight. And we're going to applaud you. Begin to step out. Make room for people up here in the middle. If you guys will squeeze in as tight as you can. Squeeze in as tight as you can tonight. Continue to make room. If you raise your hand. If you guys right here in the middle will keep just coming in. Keep filing in so people can make their way up. Keep filing in as much as you can. Awesome. Can we give them one more big hand? So here's what this is, and I need you to really catch this right now. I'm going to pray for you guys. I'm going to pray for you guys in a second. We're going to sing um, an amazing song that's kind of on this theme and this idea. And when we sing, just in those few moments, if you're willing, I want you just to raise your hands, and I want you to sing these words. Or if you just want to have a moment between you and God, I just want you to say, God, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, we are helpless walking through this life if we don't have the direction of the Holy Spirit. We're helpless in this life if we're trying to spread the gospel and the salvation of Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. We're hopeless. There is a reason that Jesus said, before you go, wait, because you have to have this power. Before you go, you have to have this power. And I believe that tonight, before you go tonight, you have to have this power. Don't walk out of these doors one more time living life under your own strength and your own power. You don't have to. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you and guide you tonight. Now, when we pray, it's not going to be like electric shocks up your body where you just start feeling power, like your muscles aren't just going to like get bigger. Like there's not going to be this weird moment that takes place. You may not even feel different when you walk out of here. But here's what I can promise. As you do this tonight, February 7, 2018, write it down. So I believe tonight's a night that a lot of your lives begin to change forever. But as you write this down, as you remember what you're doing right now, and then I want to challenge you, for the next week, every morning, set a reminder before you walk out of here. Every morning, I want you to get on your knees physically. And I want you to say, Holy Spirit, fill me today. Holy Spirit, give me your power today. Holy Spirit, help me see people the way Jesus saw them when he walked this earth today. Guide me today so that I don't wander lost through this life. Guys, life is short. We don't have time to be lost. We need his direction. We need his guidance, that voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. And I'm just looking for a group of people who will say, I'm sick and tired of walking around with the same fear and the same spirit of timidity as, as the rest of the world. But from this point forward, I'm going to be marked by the power and the passion and the fire of the Holy Spirit. People will now be drawn to you and they will come to you because they know that you are that rock in their life. They know that you're the one they can turn to in this life. So if you would, would you guys, if you're up here, would you lift both hands? Close your eyes for a moment. This is a moment between you and God. And I just want to pray over you. We're going to sing and we're going to close out this service. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus into this world. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done by sending your Holy Spirit. There's so many times where we just wish you were here. But thank you for sending the gift of your Spirit. And I just pray right now that you would come over each and every one of us. God, right now with our own mouths, we ask, we say, Spirit, fill us. Holy Spirit, give us your power. 
Empower us to hear your voice. Empower us to follow your plan. Empower us to be a witness everywhere we go. Guide us, Holy Spirit. I pray that there wouldn't be one more day that we walk around lost. There wouldn't be one more day that we walk around timid or with fear. There wouldn't be one more day that we try to operate without your power and your strength. Tonight, we surrender to you. Tonight, God, we give our arrow to you. We place it in your hands, and we say, God, send us wherever you want to send us. Lit by the Holy Spirit, empowered by your spirit, send us where you want to, and we will do what you want us to do. God, we love you, and we praise you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.